Ah, the colonization of the Americas. A bloody affair that defined the course of history and paved the way for Europe's brief but noteworthy dominion over the world. One of the great mysteries of our timeline is why it was us Europeans that got away with conquering the New World. After all, Europe in the late 15th and early 16th centuries was, by all accounts, a backwater. It accounted for a tiny fraction of the world's GDP compared to the ancient civilizations of India and China, who would remain the top dogs until the Industrial Revolution. Now, India was pretty far away from the Americas, so we can give it a hall pass, but China was closer and reasonably well situated for trans-oceanic endeavors. So why didn't the Chinese colonize the Americas? Well, if we go back to the early 1500s, right around the time when the Europeans were kicking off their Grand Slam American conquest, the Chinese Empire was going in a very different direction. It was under the rule of the Ming Dynasty, famous for kicking out the Mongol descendants of our dear friend and world record genocide enthusiast Genghis Big G Khan. Now, we already did a video on the Mongols and their brief rule over all of China, but in a nutshell, during their reign, China was integrated into the wider trade network of the Mongol Empire that stretched across most of Eurasia. This supercharged version of the Silk Road came to an abrupt end when the Mongols were overthrown, and while China was once again ruled by the Chinese, it was also again hostile to foreigners and generally indifferent to trade. This, of course, makes perfect sense when you consider China's geography. Its central heartland along its three major rivers is flanked on all sides by vast mountains and deserts and the endless Pacific Ocean. From the point of view of the Chinese emperors, China was the center of the universe, and the farther away something was from China, the less important it was. And the Americas, situated on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, were very far away. Now, I mean, the Chinese did have the technological capabilities to reach the Americas in theory, if they knew where to look. Chinese shipbuilding was nothing to scoff at, and in fact, one of the very first acts of the new Ming Dynasty was the construction of a vast fleet of over 300 ships. The emperor commissioned some of the largest wooden-framed vessels in history, supposedly reaching up to 100 meters in length, though that's disputed. This grand fleet, however, was not sent east into the unknown, but instead went southwest along the familiar trade routes of old. First to the maritime kingdoms of Indonesia, and then through the Indian Ocean towards Arabia. China, of course, like any empire, still sought to enforce its will onto others. But Chinese imperialism was different from the tried and true European brand we all know and love. Uh, well, most of us, anyway. You see, unlike Western Europe, China was economically self-sufficient. It had no shortage of arable land and no pressing issues of overpopulation. In fact, in the 1500s, it was still recovering from the slaughter of the Mongols two centuries prior. In other words, China had no pressure to engage in the expensive business of settling distant lands. Instead, it focused on extracting tribute from its neighbors, ensuring their recognition of Chinese hegemony, and generally calling it a day of that. Thus, the great treasure ships of the Ming Dynasty were really only used to re-establish the Chinese tributary system, which had disintegrated when the Mongols were overthrown. Now, to be clear, these voyages were a shining success. They brought in gifts of gold, silver, and ivory, and also various pets for the emperor including zebras, camels, ostriches, and at least one giraffe. But once the tributary system was back up and running, the need for such voyages disappeared. The last one departed from China in 1431, and since then, the empire more or less maintained its traditional isolationist policy, where foreigners were banned from entering China and Chinese subjects were forbidden from leaving without special imperial dispensation. These policies remain even after the Ming Dynasty was overthrown by another group of nomads. This time, though, it was the Manchus, not the Mongols, who, to their credit, did oversee the largest ever territorial expansion of China. But even this next-door neighbor imperialism would not be enough. For a while, China slumbered in blissful isolation, 
Europe took over half the world, and by the time the British came knocking at the gates of the Forbidden City, it was already far too late to compete. I mean, China did eventually overcome its so-called century of humiliation, and it has now come roaring back to the top. In fact, some would argue that it has now become the biggest rival to the West. And yet, not everyone agrees. And as you probably well know, finding out the truth in this day and age is becoming an increasingly difficult endeavor. Alas, not all media can be as unbiased as us here at SideQuest. Luckily for you, our dear friends over at Ground News have made it their mission to shine a light on the bias of global media and to hold journalism to a higher standard. Using their website and app, you can get your daily news with a detailed breakdown of which media outlets are covering it, what biases they have, who their owners are, and how factual their reporting is. You can easily sort through articles to see how major issues are being framed by news outlets around the world, allowing you to form an educated opinion, and ultimately getting you closer to the truth. You see, I start all my mornings with ground news, and you can too by going to ground.news forward slash sidequest, or by visiting the link in the description. It'll help you stay informed and unbiased. It's a rare and savory combo. And now, at the grand finale, I'd like to thank you for watching, my dear friends. We shall hear each other again soon, or at least you shall hear me. So stay tuned for the next hypothetically hegemonic episode of Science!